look at the cost of money. The cost of money for people to borrow is at 12.6%. The very entrepreneur that needs to compete in Indonesia, when he or she borrows from a bank, he or she needs to be paying 12.6% interest rate vis-a-vis -vis his competitor in Malaysia who only has to pay 4.6% and Singapore about 5.4%. Actually, I know of many that pay less than 5.4% in Singapore. And look at the financial inclusion. The financial inclusion, only 36% of Indonesians that are 15-year-olds or older have access to bank accounts. Vis-a-vis, 81% in Malaysia. Vis-a-vis, 96% in Singapore. You want to talk about innovation? You got to put money on the table. If you don't put money on the table, you're going to be less innovative. And if you want to put money on the table more, you got to make sure that more than 36% of the 15-year-olds in Indonesia have access to capital. And the only way to do that is not to open branches physically. The only way to game change that is to get people in this room to participate in the fintech story, in the mobile banking story, as has been explained by Kablan and all the others this morning. This is our tax ratio. This is the ratio of how much money is collected by the government vis-a-vis -vis the GDP. We can brag about the success of the tax amnesty recently. By the way, the tax amnesty program was by far the most successful in terms of the amount of assets declared. About $350 billion. The second most successful would have been that by Spain at about 75 billion US. Beyond which, South Africa, Chile, India, less than 15 billion US. We were able to get people to disclose around 350 billion US dollars. But the downside to that narrative is how much money was declared overseas. Only about 80 billion dollars. Out of the 350 billion dollars, only 80 billion dollars were related to assets that were parked overseas. And the bigger downside, out of the $80 billion, only $8 billion were repatriated. So we can brag about the fact that $350 billion of assets were de de declared, but only $80 billion were declared from offshore, and only $8 billion were repatriated back to Indonesia. 12% is a low number, ladies and gentlemen. Other countries have been able to display bigger numbers, bigger tax collecting capabilities. The only way to do that, or to increase the 12%, is to get more and more people to pay taxes. And the tax amnesty was instrumental in getting more and more people to pay taxes. In my view, this percentage is gonna go up in the near future by way of more and more people becoming aware and taking ownership with what's important for the country, the nation, and the people of Indonesia. This is an internet penetration picture. Basically, what you want to be is you want to be dark. We're light colored. We're light colored in the sense that we're not as wired as the countries that are in dark territories. We want to be as dark as those friends of ours in North America and Northern Europe and Korea and Japan. Can we get there? Absolutely. Because we're inspired by these boxes of big companies that want to globalize. Apple, Microsoft, Cisco, and Patrick's company. Only 16% of Indonesia's college graduates have engineering degrees. Malaysia, 33%. Vietnam, 24%. What would it take? You know, if you go to schools in the US or Europe, there's usually two schools of thought. You want to go liberal arts way, or you want to go STEM way. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You know, I studied classical music, and I became a jazz musician. And the reason why I was able to jazz myself up is because I had the core. I had the core of classical music. 
And I do think if you want to be creative or innovative, you don't, from the get-go, try to liberate your minds. I think you gotta learn the core. You gotta learn the formulas. You gotta learn the science. Beyond which, if you're put in this corridor of formulas, of science, you start imagining things. And you combine that with the freedom to liberate your mind, I think the sky's the limit. As opposed to getting yourself started with an ability to liberate your mind but not knowing the formulas and the science, you're not gonna be able to learn jazz without classical music. Most gra uh, great jazz musicians have had a background in classical music. And again, I'm not generalizing, but I know a lot of people who've succeeded as jazz musicians, and they all learn classical music. So this is an area where I think Indonesia needs to improve upon, i.e. to ramp up that 16% figure in terms of the number of engineering students to a much greater percentage if we want to be innovative. This is the sign. We've got the pipe called Instagram, Facebook. Indonesia is ranking pretty good. We're number two after India at 68 million people being users and actively at 31 million. Instagrams were number one, 6.7 million. Not bad, but not good if you only show pictures of yourselves, right? It's good if you can put some, some of that slides before my presentation on Facebook, on Instagram, so that people could learn about what people are actually doing on artificial intelligence. So we've got the pipe, we've got the excitement, we've got the interest, we've just gotta make sure that whatever that goes through the pipe is something that's educational. Educational in the sense that it's gonna help ourselves innovate better. Unicorns, these are companies that are worth more than $1 billion each. And we hit the record of Gojek by being the first unicorn out of Indonesia. Thank goodness. And I think the founder is gonna be speaking later at this event this afternoon. It's good. Yes, China has a lot more. North America has a lot more. Europe has a lot more. But one is better than zero. And one will help other founders and companies to innovate better as to become the next unicorn. That, I think, is a possibility for Indonesia. Shweb asked me, will Indonesia innovate or die? I certainly choose not to die. I think Indonesia will innovate. If you go back to the history of Indonesia, we struggled for our independence. We survived. We went through the tough times in the 60s. We went through the tough times of the late 90s. The Asian financial crisis was basically the narrative that people were using to write the next narrative in that Indonesia would balkanize politically, economically, financially, culturally, socially, and everything. But we beat against the odds that people were putting, almost the same way people were beating the odds on Donald Trump's victory a few days ago. We have survived. We have trimmed our debt from a debt to GDP ratio of 100% to a mere 24%. We have taken our economy from the brink of disaster to being the eighth largest economy in the world. We have taken ourselves to the membership of the G20. The art of the possible is there. But are we gonna stop right there? No, absolutely not. We're not gonna stop at spending $8 per person on research and development. We're gonna stop when we're spending on a per capita basis on research more than our neighbors are spending, more than $1,600 that the Singaporeans are spending. But what would it take to get there? It would take perseverance. It would take a lot of prayers too, but it would take a lot more money on the table by way of increasing our fiscal space from 12% tax ratio 
to 20%, hopefully to the 30% that OECD countries are characterized by. And it takes a few innovators to set examples for other people that have not been thinking about innovating. I'll end with a quote. It's not the strongest that survives. It's not the most intelligent. It's really the most adaptable. And Indonesia is an adaptable nation. Thank you very much. <laughs>
The, the conversation hasn't take, taken place enough to the point where there's enough private money coming onto the table. We can see it by the increase of the loan growth. Uh, the, the loan growth uh, rate of last year is below 10%. This year, uh, the first 10 months is only about 8.5%. Uh, it tells you that people are not borrowing enough to build factories. Uh, mind you, a few years ago, the loan growth rate was uh, over 20%. So if the private sector is not putting enough money onto the table by way of their own equity or by way of their borrowing from the banking system, uh, it makes, I think, not too much sense for the government to be putting too much or more money onto the table. So I think the way you do it is, is, is you, you, you gotta get the confidence that the private money is gonna come onto the table. The private money is not coming onto the table is probably because the rhetoric the storytelling is not where it should be or how it should be. And you, I mean, it, it almost takes me back to my previous role where I was trying to promote Indonesia and I promoted Indonesia by showing directionality. I wasn't out there as an absolutist. I wasn't out there as a deterministic personality promising nirvana. But people who come to Indonesia who wanna build factories are taking a 20 year view and all they want and seek is actually directionality. This is where I think the conversation needs to take place a little bit better. Now, if that were to take place a little bit better, I think there's more intentions for private money to be in. Now, if that were measured you know, enough for the government to feel confident that private money is gonna come, that's the time when government needs to ramp up its debt to GDP. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Please join me in uh, thanking Pagita for uh, Wonderful presentations. Thanks.